Um, okay, but good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melanie Bolden, and I am the Climate and Health Coordinator for the Maryland Public Health Association. Um, today, we are here to uh, to to have our panel discussion uh, titled "Perspectives in Climate Change," a panel discussion with local experts and students on climate change in Maryland. Uh, I'd like to first uh, introduce our partners, uh, as this event is an intercollaborative uh, partnership with the Maryland Par Public Health Association, the Montgomery County Board of Education, and Maryland Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate, as as well as our partner, Maryland League of Conservation Voters. Um, very briefly, the Maryland Public Health Association is one of the oldest uh, chapters, uh, public health chapter affiliates uh, with the American Public Health Association. Um, it is a vo primarily voluntary or uh, volunteer based organization with health professionals from all across uh, the state of Maryland that are focused in public health and uh, spreading awareness about various public health topics um, critical to Marylanders. Uh, the Montgomery County Board of Education, of course, is seated in Rockville, Maryland, and is the primary voice and authority for Montgomery, uh, Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, and my, uh, Maryland Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate is a coalition of um, health professionals who are uh, devoted to uh, exploring topics of uh, environmental change, environmental health and climate change and spreading awareness um, and leveraging the voice, uh, their voice as public health professionals to environmental um, health causes. And last but not least is the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. This is a, an organization that uh, is an advocacy organization based in Maryland and is primarily focused on uh, environmental health issues uh, challenging Marylanders. And I'll also want to spotlight our my uh, co, uh, co coordinator, Rebecca Rare, to speak a bit more about the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. Let me, I'll pass the mic to Rebecca. Thanks so much, Melanie. So excited to be here this afternoon um, and excited to see everyone here joining us for National Public Health Week. Um, and this event and, and what I'm sure will be a, a really interesting dialogue that we'll have in a little bit. Um, I'm Rebecca Rear. I'm the Director of Climate Policy and Justice at Maryland LCV, um, calling in from Annapolis during the last few days of the legislative session. Uh, you know, talk, we're up against the clock on several important bills. Um, so that's what I'm wrapped up in right now. But our, our um, vision is really a healthy environment for everyone in Maryland. Um, sometimes we're known as the political voice for the environment. Um, and I'll, I'll just wrap up with, it's an election year, y'all, so get to the polls. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, just to also highlight that this event is a part of both the this year's National Public Health Week and the Worldwide Climate Justice and Education Week. Um, and after we initially coordinated, we found out additionally that this is also the National Food Waste Prevention Week uh, as well. So this is what I like to refer to as the trifecta for public health awareness campaigns um, and is an amazingly important opportunity to um, raise awareness of these issues. Um, so with that, I'd like to, again, thank our event partners and collaborators. And through today's discussion, we hope that you all are able to gain insights from our experts uh, as we explore diverse perspectives surrounding climate change and its impact on public health. And we'll delve into the intersection of environmental sustainability and human well-being as well. But first, uh, a quick overview of today's so session. So uh, quickly, our schedule uh, consists of introductions and acknowledgments, which, which are happening right now uh, with me. And uh, we'll move into our speaker session from 410 to 445 or about then. Then we'll move into our moderated question and answer session, our audience Q&A or question and answer session. And then we'll highlight some, uh, we'll, we'll provide some highlights for engagement and closing and acknowledgments as well. We want to ask that you all, um, our wonderful audience, do hold your questions until the audience Q&A session. And without further delay, I would like to introduce our student moderators. So uh, first, we have Angelina Shu, a graduating high school senior and incoming freshman at Harvard University. In 2021, she co-founded the nonprofit Compostology with her partner, Advika, dedicated to implementing composting and food recovery programs at local schools. Welcome, Angelina. 
And next, we have Nana Leggett, a graduating senior at Copen State University. She's majoring in interdisciplinary studies with a minor in management. I'd like to welcome Nana as well. And with that, Thank I oh, thanks, Nana. And with that, I will pass the mic to Nana and Angelina to introduce our event speakers. Thank you, Melanie, for the great introduction. Our first speaker will be um, Dr. Laura Andico. Um, Dr. Laura Andico is an environmental health nurse consultant and the co-director for the Federal Region 3 Pediatric Environmental Health Speciality Unit of the Mid-Atlantic Center for the Children's Health and Environmental at the M. Lewis Fitzpatrick College of Nursing, um, the Lenova University. Prior to her joining um, the Lenovo University, she held the Robert and Kathleen Scullin Chair of Value-Based Healthcare and was a professor at the School of Nursing and Health Studies in Georgetown University. Um, Dr. Aniko is an educator, clinician, and a scholar in public health, nursing, and environmental health. Dr. Aniko was recognized by the Obama White House as champions of change for her efforts in graduate uh, in educating communities and health professionals about climate change and the public health. She received her MS in nursing from Northern Illinois University and her PhD in public health from University of Illinois, Chicago. Let's give a nice welcome to Dr. Laura Andico. Thank you, Doctor, for being here today. Thank you for that uh, great introduction, Nana. I really appreciate it. Um, mm -hmm. We are going to begin our session today uh, with a um, quick run through on what is climate change, sort of the overall uh, gestalt of climate change, how it impacts health, what's going on in Maryland, uh, some of my work, which focuses on pregnant women and children, and um, uh, then some solutions before we move to the next speaker. So as we talk this, this afternoon about um, climate change and how it impacts our health, it's really important for us to think about where we sit today and how we appreciate the world around us and how it impacts our health. Right now, we're on the left side of that diagram, which is egocentric. We're on the top of the pyramid. We really need to make that more um, uh, collaborative and uh, find the delicate balance that we sit as human beings within uh, living systems and living things within the planet. You may recognize this fella. He's Martin, uh, excuse me, he's uh, <laughs> Mark Twain. Uh, and he said something pretty brilliant, which is climate is what we expect and weather is what we get. Um, climate change has been measured based on years and years of records of weather, right? So where I'm at today in Northern Virginia, it's rainy and cold and that's April weather. Um, it was 85 and sunny in February. That's not normal based on the climate data that we've been keeping. Uh, and so as we look at some of these trends, it's really important for us to remember that when we talk about climate change, we're talking about years and years of records um, and those aberrations or differences from what we consider as normal. Uh, we know that 2023 was the world's warmest year on record across the world and also in Maryland. And why is that? Well, there's human influences that have impacted what's called the greenhouse effect. And on the left side of the screen is what we would like with a natural greenhouse effect. We want to stay warm. Um, and you see that band, that atmospheric band of greenhouse gases that include carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane, lets the solar radiation in and lets the heat escape. On the right, unfortunately, is where we're at today. We have a thick band of these greenhouse gases that let the solar radiation in, but less heat can escape. So we're having this warming effect within um, our planet. 
And I thought it'd be important for us to think about those three greenhouse gases, because as we're thinking about solutions and what we can do to make those gases less, uh, we need to know where they come from. So carbon dioxide comes from burning fossil fuels to create electricity and to heat our homes and businesses, burning gasoline for the vehicles that we drive, cutting down and burning uh, trees and other vegetation. And we'll talk about that in our next slide. And then some things like producing cement, believe it or not. When we take that trip to the local store, all those emissions, the emissions that are made last 50 to 1,000 or more years in that atmospheric band. They don't dissipate all, right away. The next greenhouse gas is methane. And methane primarily comes from livestock. And that is produced when they digest their food and when their manure decays. Um, as I was mentioning, cutting down and burning trees has happened um, uh, in um, astronomical levels in the Amazon, for example, uh, so that they can produce cattle for this increasing need for beef across the world. So cutting down the trees, trees produce oxygen for us, take in carbon dioxide. So as we're cutting down trees, we're making the problem even worse. Um, landfills, and um, Advika will be talking about um, composting, as we put trash into landfills, that trash creates methane. Um, methane is, lasts for about 12 years once it's released in the environment, but the same amount of methane compared to carbon dioxide is 20 times, captures 20 times more heat than carbon dioxide. So it's a more potent gas. And finally, we have nitrous oxide. And this comes primarily from farming practices where we add nitrogen uh, to the soil in the, in the form of fertilizers, burning again fossil fuels to run our vehicles, and things like nitrous oxide, which is used in operating rooms. Nitrous oxide lasts about 114 years once it's emitted, but this gas is 298 times more um, potent in trapping heat than the same amount of carbon dioxide. So what does this mean for Maryland? Well, Maryland is seeing, like the rest of the world, increasing temperatures, and there's predictions of longer and more intense heat waves, increases in the intensity and frequency of precipitation, rising sea levels and retreating shores, uh, which can lead to saltwater intrusion, right? That sea level rises, salt water gets into our um, uh, drinking water, uh, as well as into the farm fields. Homes and infrastructures are being impacted. Because of the precipitation and the flooding, we're seeing more and more homes and communities really impacted negatively by these changes. Uh, this picture is a picture of the last home standing in, on Holland Island, which is one of a chain of Chesapeake Islands that have now, are now underwater. Uh, this was in 2010, and it was right before the house succumbed to the rising sea level. Uh, this was an island that was a full community. And if you Google uh, Holland Island in Maryland, you will see videos of people talking about their lives on the island and how they had to leave. Fishing and agricultural industries are impacted. In Maryland, we know about the blue crabs being really um, severely impacted by the acidic water, which is a part of climate change um, and of course, human health. So this diagram in the center talks about all those things that are happening with the climate changes that we are seeing and that are being recorded. The outer two circles really talk about what happens to our environment and how that impacts our health. We don't have time to talk about all of these, but I'd like to focus on something that happens really frequently, particularly in Maryland, is the green bar on the right, uh, air pollution. So we know that as temperature goes up, air quality goes down. Why? Because that pollution gets intensified. And it, we will see in the hospitals increases in uh, admissions with asthma attacks, heart attacks. We're also seeing increasing allergens as a result of the heat. 
Uh, and Dr. Kurtzman will be talking about the mental health impacts as well. But you can see there is a whole variety of illnesses and diseases that are either getting worse or just coming up. Zika, which is not even on this, uh, became um, a, new, a new disease as a result of vector-borne disease and climate changes. My work focuses on children and pregnant women um, and young adults. So young adults and children are not adults. They don't have, their bodies are still developing through the age of 18, lungs, brains, um, all of that and hearts are impacted in a bigger way with all these climate changes. And on top of that, children that may be living in poverty or in areas that are already highly polluted, then we get these increases in temperatures that really intensifies even more that pollution. Um, this can of course lead to more stressors, anxiety and mental health issues. So how do we make it better? How do we reduce those greenhouse gases? We can protect and plant trees. We can eat less meat. Um, there's meatless Mondays a lot of people are doing um, to help reduce our impact. We'll drive less or drive vehicles with lower emissions. Use public transportation. Ride your bike. Use less energy. Turn off your computer when it's not in use and use renewable energy sources when you can. Reduce waste. And at Vico, we'll be talking about composting. Um, again, this leads to methane uh, gases. Advocate for policies that support clean air. And Rebecca said, election year, if you can vote, vote. And if you can't vote, advocate for those candidates that will protect our environment. So in closing, the health effects of climate change are here. They're inevitable. We need action to reduce those emissions. Um, we need to uh, support policies that will protect the most vulnerable. And by doing so, it's win-win. We will improve everyone's health by doing that. This is just my contact information below and part of the national network that um, uh, does a lot of work in climate cha change and pediatric health. And that's it for me. Thank you, Dr. Andico, for such a uh, for the information you gave us today. Um, a lot of people don't really know that climate change and mental health go hand in hand. So, with that, you know, you mentioned mental health, uh, the public environment. Um, so, we definitely need to keep it uh, clean. So at this point, I would like to turn the mic over to my co-moderator, Angelina, to introduce the next host. Thank you so much, Nana. I'm really okay. proud um, to cover this. Our previous speaker, Dr. Anna Ko, uh, talked a lot about health effects and climate change and the intersection between the two. And she also mentioned mental health, which brings us to our next speaker, who I am delighted to introduce, Dr. Howard Kurtzman. Uh, Dr. Howard Kurtzman holds a PhD, and he is a psychological scientist who has held research and administrative positions at Cornell University, the National Institute of Mental Health, and the American Psychological Association. At APA, he oversaw much of the association's work on climate change, including two major task force reports on psychology and climate change released in 2009 and 2022. Two reports with Eco America on mental health and climate change in 2017 and 2021, along with climate advocacy to Congress and the White House, and engagement with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Currently, he works with the Climate Psychology Alliance North America and Climate Psychiatry Alliance on advocacy at the state and local levels for policies that address the mental health and social impacts of climate change. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Howard Kurtzman. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I, thanks Angelina. And I wanna thank uh, Melanie Bolden and uh, the sponsoring organizations for organizing this webinar and, and inviting me to 
participate. Uh, as uh, Angelina said, I represent the Joint Advocacy and the Climate Psychology Alliance North America. Uh, our two organizations together have more than 1,000 mental health professionals as members throughout the United States, including Maryland. Um, I'm going to begin by briefly characterizing what is known in general uh, about the connections of climate change with mental health and social well-being, then talk about how mental health professionals currently think about how to respond to climate change, and finally offer some recommendations for steps that governments and private organizations can take. Now, discussions of climate change can be scary and discouraging for people of all ages. That's a normal reaction. Uh, I will be laying out some distressing information about the mental health impacts of climate change. But my main point today is that there are things that our communities and institutions can do to enable people to prepare for and adapt to climate change. Trying to change the slide now. So uh, to start, a large body of published peer-reviewed research shows that uh, climate change uh, leads to or worsens a broad range of mental and behavioral health conditions and societal problems. This research has been conducted by various investigators throughout the world. It has examined the effects of severe weather events and disasters as well as the effects of longer term shifts in heat, sea level, and weather patterns. This work shows that climate change in its various manifestations puts people at higher risk for post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression, and misuse of alcohol and drugs, family dysfunction, aggressive behavior, and violence performance in school and at work may decline. Now, to be clear, climate change does not affect all people in these ways or even most people, but it does increase the numbers of people who may experience these effects. Uh, the psychological stress associated with climate-related events can also affect physical health, including functioning of the cardiovascular, immune, and digestive systems. Regarding heat in particular, we know that there are more emergency room visits for mental health reasons on the hottest days. And those who use medications prescribed by psychiatrists may experience greater side effects on the hottest days to mainly the effects of those medications, the body's temperature regulation, their levels of aggression and violence. Recent evidence indicates that climate change can affect the prenatal development of children's brains, such that in later life, they are more likely to have reduced cognitive abilities, reduced behavioral and emotional self-control, and increased risk for mental disorders. How frequent or severe these impacts are varies across populations and, and settings. Uh, in general, those who are at greater risk for these impacts include people who are economically disadvantaged, uh, people of color in the United States, women, children, older adults, people with disabilities, people who have pre-existing mental health conditions, and outdoor workers. There is a growing research literature on climate anxiety, which occurs most frequently among adolescents and young adults. In a major study several years ago of 10,000 young people in 10 countries, including the US, more than half reported they were very worried or anxious about climate change and feared for the future of the world and themselves. They also expressed feelings of betrayal by their governments for not adequately responding to climate change. If you have those feelings, you're, you're certainly not alone. We should also note that climate change is a significant driver of migration. For example, climate change and its consequences are uh, important factors leading people to migrate from Central America to the United States. In Maryland, the major impacts of climate change, as we heard, include heat, heavy rains, flooding, and storm damage, which then affect homes, transportation, 
and the operations of many institutions, businesses, and services. We can expect these impacts to increase in the coming years and to have mental health and social consequences. And those consequences will interact with other existing challenges across the state related to health, education, housing, violence, and social justice. So what do we do about all this? Uh, let me turn now to some general principles that underlie much of the thinking of mental health professionals regarding climate change. First, mental health is health and should be considered whenever health broadly is being addressed. Anxiety, depression, and addictions are genuine biological and environmental factors. And as I noted, they interact with other physical conditions and processes such as cardiovascular disease and immune function. Mental health conditions can also interfere with the maintenance of healthy behaviors related to diet, sleep, and physical activity. Um, I said earlier that climate change is a factor contributing to interpersonal conflict and lower academic performance. Those are not themselves mental health conditions, but they can be consequences of mental health conditions where they can arise from many of the same biological and environmental factors that lead to poor mental health. Second, uh, mental health professionals argue that in responding to climate change, we need to build not only the resilience of physical interest, infrastructure like buildings and utilities, but also the resilience of people, that is people's thoughts, feelings and behaviors in the face of climate change. Such psychological and social resilience encompasses a broad range of features, including, and this is a long list, positive attitudes, coping skills, ability to regulate one's emotions, flexibility, a sense of meaning or purpose, confidence in one's ability to take successful action, positive family relations and other social connections, community cohesion, uh, making practical preparations for disasters, and for some engaging in advocacy and activism. Uh, these features of resilience may take different forms at different stages of life. Resilience can help protect people from the negative impacts of climate change and enable them to respond more constructively to a changing environment. Uh, this is important because we probably cannot rely entirely on improvements to physical infrastructure to shield us from the effects of worsening heat and storms. We also cannot predict all the future consequences of climate change or how they will interact with other challenges such as disease outbreaks or social conflicts. People will need to be ready for anything. That is, individuals and communities will need to be psychologically and socially resilient. This leads to the third principle, that building resilience to climate change requires a preventive approach that engages with the entire population. This is often called a public health approach. We usually think of psychologists and psychiatrists as providing treatment to individuals after they have acquired a mental health or behavioral condition. And that will always be an important part of our work. But increasingly, mental health professionals are interested in preventing disorders, or at least reducing their occurrence and severity by strengthening the resilience of all members of a community or population. Further, our fields are now paying greater attention to the specific environments and contexts in which people live, as well as to the different levels of economic and social resources they, they have. And we are paying greater attention to people's racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds and to their beliefs and attitudes. Through such work, we aim to identify and reduce disparities in health and well being among groups within the overall population. Now, my colleagues and I have developed recommendations for actions that governments at all levels can pursue in collaboration with local institutions and community members. Here, I will touch on a few of our recommendations in, in general terms. Each of these could be developed in specific forms that suit the needs and characteristics of the communities being served. First, we recommend that an assessment be made of the current mental health and social impacts of climate change in the population, breaking those down by, say, counties, towns, neighborhoods, and demographic groups. Based on that assessment and our understanding of future climate trends, 
projections could be made of future needs for mental health and community services related to climate change. Such assessments and projections could be conducted by government agencies and or researchers at local universities with input from community organizations and residents. Next, we recommend the development of community resilience programs to help people build the psychological, social, and practical skills and community connections that they need to prepare for and respond effectively to climate change and other challenges. These programs can take various forms and may involve government, neighborhood groups, nonprofit organizations, schools, faith communities, and businesses, among others. One model is resilience hubs. These are community centers that offer ongoing programs and resources to residents to strengthen their skills and connections and provide emergency services in case of a climate or other emergency. And there are some examples of resilience hubs uh, in Baltimore and Washington, DC. A key aspect of any resilience program is that uh, it is to a significant degree designed and managed by the community itself, not imposed by government or outside experts. We also recommend that healthcare and social service providers receive training on the mental health and social impacts of climate change uh, communities. Such training is available already from various universities and organizations around the country. One possibility is to have such training become a required component of providers' initial training or their continuing education over the course of their careers. More broadly, we recommend that governments and other organizations communicate via traditional and social media to professionals and leaders in other fields and to the public about climate change and its mental health and social impacts. Uh, although most people have a general concept of climate change, not all understand how it will increasingly affect them in their everyday lives and how they can become prepared for it. And there is research by psychologists and other social scientists uh, that has identified strategies for successful communications about climate change. And turning to K-12 education, we suggest that environmental or climate education be a, a required part of the curriculum and that the mental health and social aspects of climate change be included in that curriculum. Uh, we believe that students would benefit from coverage of those areas, both to enhance their intellectual understanding of climate change and to help them develop emotionally healthy and constructive responses to climate change. Uh, now, the organizations I work with, the Climate Psychiatry Alliance and Climate Psychology Alliance, are advocating for such initiatives in various states and cities. In fact, Maryland is fortunate to have many excellent organizations that work to limit climate change and its harmful impacts. I encourage everyone, as you are able, to join in or support the work of such organizations. We can talk about some of those later, uh, identify some of them later. Um, getting involved in organizations is good for your environment and may well be good for your mental health as well. So I'll stop there. Uh, thanks for listening. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Kurtzman. Um, I really enjoy that. And I really um, like the fact that you are, you know, the connection between mental health and our climate and getting the children involved at an early age. Um, that brings us to our next speaker, who's a high school senior uh, by the name of Advika Agarwal. Uh, she's a high school senior from Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, as a co-founder of the Cosmo Postology Corp, a county and state student um, government leader and one of 12 global road, I'm sorry if I pronounce this wrong, road to act, um, delegate to the UN Climate Change Conference, COP28 in Dubai. Advika has worked over five years on food waste aversion, water equality, 
and environmental education resulting in $2.5 million in funds and, and the enactment of the new local environmental policies. Everyone, let's welcome Advika Agro, our next speaker. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. And actually, Compostology was co-founded with Angelina, who is a moderator here today. So we do it all together, and we have been for the past five years. And Compostology is a youth nonprofit that diverts school food waste from incineration and landfills to instead be composted, recovered, and utilized as a tool for legislation. We started in Montgomery County, Maryland, when we were both in seventh grade with our friend Shrusti Amula. And um, we're now expanding slowly but surely globally. So I'm here to explain that journey and how, um, like our previous speakers have said, this journey empowers students' mental health, physical health, and environmental health. So before I begin, I just wanted to shout out our team. I already explained Angelina and I are both seniors at Richard Montgomery High School in Montgomery County, soon to graduate and go on to college. So we have an amazing director team succeeding us, and they are juniors and sophomores, and we have one senior um, in high school as well. And we are an all-women-led team, which is something that's important to us. Um, our identity as an all-female team has been pretty important in showing a lot of young women and young girls in elementary school and up that women are no less in their capability to lead. So the programs that we launch in schools are pretty straightforward, but they have a not so straightforward impact uh, in many different ways. So the first prong is food recovery. Any unopened items that students cannot eat, won't eat, are placed on share carts and refrigerators to be redistributed to other students in the same school. And you would be surprised to learn that about 70 items are um, saved every day from each school, and 100% of that um, is being redistributed to fellow students. We do have a system in place to send those items out to shelters and food banks, but we have not needed to because students have a need to reclaim that food and this easy process has the capacity to fulfill that. Um, there have been some roadblocks in terms of um, standards and rules surrounding, you know, is the food preserved well enough to be redistributed because we don't want counties to run into any liability issues or health issues. But by working closely with our county officials, we have been able to develop a standard procedure that does mitigate any of those concerns. So um, throughout this presentation, you might be interested in starting similar programs because they are relatively relatively easy to maintain. Um, there can be some roadblocks going into it, as you might imagine, but we have a strong network of people here at Compostology, from students to adults, who are all ready to help you in doing the same. So at the end, I'll share um, a bit about how you can join us. So the next part of this is diversion. We have school composting bins next to the trash and recycling. Um, they are green in color and students really love them, but all they do is throw any uneaten food that they cannot save into those bins. So those are things like apple rinds, banana peels, uh, sandwich crusts, and we collect anywhere from 500 to 2,000 pounds of food waste to be composted every month from a single school. And to put this in perspective, we have run the calculations based on how much food waste elementary, middle, and high schools produce. And if all the public schools in Maryland were to do this program, we could divert about 1.5 million trash bags of food waste from being incinerated and landfilled to instead turn into healthier soil that can grow healthier food. Um, so in the process of these two prongs, we really incorporate peer-to-peer -peer education for students from K through 12. So we have our big high school team going into elementary and middle schools to not only teach students how to recover and compost their food, but through that share their experiences with student leadership in and outside of the environmental realm. We have of, um, green team development, as you can see in the picture on the right, where we give creative activities for students to do, like waste sorts and data collection and art projects um, that carry a strong impact because of the importance of um, having people care for the environment from a young age. Through these programs, students aren't just learning about environment on paper, but they're taking that leadership role in making a real impact. And that's what students um, we've seen get excited about over and over again. 
Uh, and of course, it's also a leadership opportunity for these high schoolers. And one story I like to bring up is something that I've remembered for so many years. I visited a school a few years ago, and I met a little girl who I call Ayana, just for privacy reasons, it is a fake name. But um, she shared a story with me about how she was experiencing bullying at school. And she was also facing some instability at home. But through that, she was smiling, and she was very enthusiastic about um, she asked me a question, how can I be like you and Angelina? And I thought that was so sweet that a little second grader was getting so excited about how she could be like us, how she could become a student leader and empower herself to move past those struggles. Um, I also, everyone has their own struggles, whether they be health, mental health, physical health, but student leadership has been a source of empowerment for so many students. And if that can heal our planet as well, then why not give more students the chance to do the same? These are just some more pictures from our various programs. We have assemblies, waste sorts, green teams, all the things I've mentioned in action, bringing a smile to kids' faces. To emphasize a little bit more of why this program is needed from the environmental standpoint, um, this is just a micro level look at the problem. So we took a bunch of students and we sorted just one trash bag out of the 13 trash bags produced uh, every day from a local elementary school. And we saw that only 10 out of 100 pounds of waste was in fact landfill trash. Um, we had 32.3 pounds of that being food that did not have to be landfill. It could have been composted and and if you see those unopened milks and juices there on the bottom, that all came out of the trash bag. That is so much food that we can save for our students who need them. And over 50% of the, the schools that we work at have um, high rates of students who need free and reduced price meal service. Um, and those are the same schools that do reclaim all the food that we are recovering. Um, to just show a little bit more about our impact, I didn't mention this, but this is data from our very first program in 2018. And at this time, in the first six months, um, we were taking about 10 pounds of food waste from every kid that would have otherwise been landfilled. Um, so the program does not take much to educate about and launch, but we are seeing that over the course of the year, the weight of trash and the weight of food waste both decrease. So the overall amount of waste generated by students is also decreasing, um, which just speaks to this program as an educational tool and waste prevention. Um, beyond compostology, we have partnered with a lot of different officials in the county and state who are so supportive. So when adults come together to support student visions, these new types of impacts can arise. So we have our wonderful mentors, Mr. Richardson and Mr. Meyer and Ms. Weiss, who is actually from MDPHA. She was the advocacy chair uh, some time ago, if any of you know her. But altogether, we received $48,000 from the World Wildlife Fund, and that has really propelled our progress beyond just starting programs. Um, to now get into the community with presentations like this, um, to teach kids through our programs, and to move beyond school walls into legislation. So our first uh, you know, major milestone was helping to introduce State Bill 124, which is now a $1.25 million grant program to reduce and compost school waste. So Angelina and I um, and our mentors helped write some of the language of the bill and you know, helped develop this idea, making sure that it emphasized student leadership. So it's now funding um, about 40 schools for the remaining of this year to start their own versions of the programs that we piloted. And we're still advocating for the remainder of the funds to be put in for the next four years. And we mobilized students at 90 different schools to send about 17,000 postcards to Annapolis. And then we hand delivered them and gave presentations to our officials, including the Maryland Secretary of Environment, Michael Wayne. And um, the legislators repeatedly emphasized that it's one thing to see this ask on paper, but when they heard 17,000 thousand students sharing compelling reasons why they need this bill to pass, um, it forced them to put this bill at the top of their priority list. I know we might be running short of time, so I'll breeze through the rest real quick. Um, beyond, besides the state, we've also had um, a county impact. Because we were collecting this data from our programs, our county did mandate food recovery in all of our 211 public schools. And um, we also, they kind of revitalized the job description of the county official that we collaborate with so closely. So now his job focuses on supporting more student projects like ours, um, so that's 
students can make so many more impacts on the environment and their health. Um, and because of him, we're able to roll out this mandate in the 211 schools. And currently we have the 75 plus started. We also inspired our superintendent to start the Student Climate Action Coalition, which is a group of students with uh, who are on the task force of the Board of Education and have the power to distribute $75,000 in funds to so many environmental projects led by students around the county. Just a recap of our progress, um, you know, just an at a glance look. It's more than the numbers to see the students in our team who have just been so driven and excited about making environmental change. It's really inspiring to adults and students, and it has been over the past five years. Um, without a platform to execute their ideas, there are so many changes that remain to be seen. So when our county invests in us, not only financially, but with their personnel support and their time um, listening to our ideas, impacts like the ones listed here can happen. And then people are always interested to hear, we were represented at the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP28, in Dubai in December. And this was just an amazing opportunity for um, uh, compostology to start chapters in other countries slowly but surely as I mentioned um, here are just some more pictures of our time there but we presented and we networked with a lot of other people in Rotary and outside of Rotary who will be bringing compostology to wherever they live and we invite you to do the same so I will paste these links in the chat but there is an interest form for you to join our coalition to reimagine school waste if you would like to start a program you can also email us if you would like to support us financially or if you would like to partner with any of the work that you are doing and please um, forward this information to your students because we are looking for students to help us fundraise and uh, present and join our arts team and we are a welcoming family for students wherever they live to work with us um, and you can also follow us on instagram it's listed there thank you Great, thank you so much, Avika. Um, for sharing your perspective as a student advocate, and I know I've personally been super proud to work with Avika over these past now three years, um, and even beyond, um, further in the past beyond that. So it's always a great experience. Um, as mentioned before, we will be holding questions for the audience question and answer segment. Um, so we're now going to be entering the moderated Q and A section. Uh, during this section, we will ask curated questions to our panel to gain further insight on their experiences, and then we'll move into audience questions. So we'll just get started with a pre-prepared question here, um, which is, how did you get first become involved in climate change and environmental health? Um, and any panelists are welcome to speak up and answer this question. I'm happy to go. Um, I uh, Many years ago, I lived and worked in Wisconsin and was working with the state health department on looking at coal-fired plants and putting methylmercury into the water, um, which impacts the fish. And it became very clear that the coal-fired plants were a huge problem, not only for the methylmercury in the fish, but also for climate change. And of course, most of us have seen Al Gore's uh, movie uh, that was a PowerPoint. Um, and it really got me to start thinking about the impact of, of air quality and coal-fired plants and how the climate was changing. Um, this was probably 20 years ago now. And so it's been a long journey and um, we have learned a lot since then. Uh, and it was not politicized uh, back then like it is now. Um, I spent probably the second half of that time convincing people that it was not a political stunt, <laughs> that it was actually based in science, climate change and the health impacts. So, um, yeah, so that's how I first got started with it, was looking at something totally unrelated, uh, well, seemingly unrelated, but that the coal-fired plants were, in fact, one of the key drivers of climate change. 
And my in my case, it was because my boss told me to work on it. Um, I was at the American Psychological Association, and uh, some members had brought to the leadership uh, ideas for for work that APA could do, in particular developing a, a major report on climate change, the behavioral aspects of and psychological aspects of climate change. So I was just assigned to work on that to to help oversee it. And I found myself getting very interested in it. I, it was an area that I wasn't familiar with. And I was also uh, very drawn to the people who work in the area. They're, they were very inspiring, both the scientists and, and for their commitment to, to the issue. Uh, and it really made me think a lot also about how deep and important the, the issue is. Uh, and then um, our CEO, uh, developed a relationship uh, between APA and Eco America, which is an important uh, advocacy organization, national advocacy organization. Uh, and we did some more work with them and I became the point person. And uh, and then both of my supervisors uh, left and they said, well, Howard, it's all in your hands now. So uh, I, I then spent a, a bunch of my time, a, a large proportion of my time working on climate change. And I found that I loved it. And I'm retired now, uh, and uh, uh, but, uh, but I'm still spending a good deal of my my time working with the Climate Psychology Alliance and Climate Psychiatry Alliance on it. So I'm glad that uh, I got that assignment and I was nudged into it. Uh, sometimes things like that work out. I'll just briefly say mine. So in seventh grade, Angelina and I and our friend, we were doing a science competition together and we all remembered seeing food waste be a huge issue in our cafeterias. So that's the origins of this project specifically, but I think I've held on to it because I guess of more of a cultural and familial connection to environmentalism. So I've studied Hindustani classical music for a long time. And I realized over the past few years that I think I really did get connected to the environment through that study. Um, you know, it's so deeply intertwined with nature. It originated from different sounds in nature and it's about nature and the different seasons. So every week I would sit there and sing about the beauty of nature and also our interdependence with it. And I think I really did internalize that perspective. And I didn't fully realize that until I reflected on, you know, why am I so passionate about continuing on compostology? So um, I think if you lean into your culture and your interest, you will probably find a connection there to the environment. And that's why it's so important that we preserve it, because the environment is what's given rise to so much of our culture. Those are all such amazing answers. Uh, and I really love hearing um, the aspects from your different backgrounds, like Avika mentioned cultures, uh, whether Dr. Kurtzman is their work experience or bossing something. Um, I think that's absolutely incredible. I'll pass off to Nana to ask the next question. Yes, thank you very much. And I really like, and I'm really hoping that a lot of people here, including myself hearing this, will start our road to helping the climate by composing, by, you know, food, making sure we're not wasting food. I really appreciate that. And I'll do my part from here on. Uh, our next question for the panel is, uh, how is how is change affecting you and your community? if anyone would like to answer that. Is, is the question, how does it in, impact me on a personal level in my personal community or, so as a public health person, I deal with communities all the time and I'm seeing lots of, and have been and conducted research on this to, to show the impacts on children in particular when the air quality um, gets worse from climate change. Do you want me to talk about it on a personal level or a professional level? Well, um, either or is fine. How okay. is affecting you, you personally or within the space that you're currently living in? How is it affecting you? Yeah, so um, so my work, which focuses in, uh, which I mentioned earlier, pregnant women and children, um, continues to be heavily influenced by what's happening in our environment, um, in particular climate change. 
And uh, we have spent many, many years educating health professionals and families and communities about these changes um, and how people can protect themselves and their families. And so um, it, one example is the EPA has an air quality flag program. And I think many of us have an app on our phone, a weather app, and you can do the air quality apps as well. And it will tell you when the air quality is gonna be unsafe to do certain things outside. And so I have worked over the years with families to say, you know, you need an app. And by the way, maybe we can get the school to put this flag up. So uh, purple is the worst day and green is the best day. And we've had, it tends to be fourth and fourth to sixth graders that learn the connection between climate change, heat and air quality. And the idea is to not only educate the children and the teachers and the principals, but the community so that that flag goes up the day before to let people know that, okay, today is a bad air quality day. Little Joey should not be out at recess because he will end up in the ER. Um, and so um, we also know that women, that those the part particulate matter will go through the placenta into the baby as, as Dr. Kurtzman was saying, and will impact the neurological development. So we spent a lot of time talking to pregnant women or women planning on pregnancies, you know, to say, you know, when the weather is, when the weather is hot, you need to stay indoors and you need to find a cooling center if you don't have a cool place to stay. And so um, making sure that people are aware of where those cooling centers are, um, it can have a huge impact on the health of the baby um, neurologically, as well as delivering preterm babies and low birth weight babies. The, the air pollution is a huge factor in many people's health, particularly for children. Thank you. Thank you very much for that response. Um, the, our next question should be asked by my co-moderator, Angelina. Yeah. Um, this question is, what do you think is the most challenging aspect of your work? I can begin then. Um, so I think students have a bit of a unique perspective and position when it comes to making change, even environmental change. So one challenge that we've faced is synthesizing the different experiences that students have. So as students, we understand pretty well what problems that we face um, in a way that many adults and decision makers just can't. They might not think that these problems exist, they might not understand exactly how they affect us and our families, but it can be difficult to find students from different parts of the state or the country um, in a way that properly encapsulates the student experience because there isn't a uniform one, and then to bring that to the attention of people who can make change happen. So we've observed these problems of food waste and uh, food insecurity and a lack of environmental education equity among all our schools in Maryland, but it was a challenge to come up with the solution that effectively addresses that. The one that we do have, the state bill, you know, it's not fully funded yet. There's administration issues and we don't have the expertise, um, the legislative expertise to find workarounds. So as students, it often comes down to adults making the time to listen to us and actually caring about the issues that we're bringing to the table because we are the next, you know, generation and set of voters. So when we express interest in a certain issue, it's very important for these legislators to take the time and not just ignore us because we're too young to be dealing with the legislature legislative process in a way that is more meaningful than just showing up and testifying a few times, but to actually remain involved in the execution of a bill from its, you know, its first stage to its execution, um, you know, throughout that whole cycle for a student to express their views can be very meaningful. And it has been for SB 124. In my case, um, my colleagues and I have talked to a lot of government officials and, and policymakers, and uh, most of them have never thought about 
uh, the mental health or the psychological aspects of climate change. And when we give them the kind of information that I presented today, uh, it opens their eyes and you can see the light bulb go off and, and they're very interested. Then later on, when we see what kinds of policies and programs have been uh, approved and implemented, there usually isn't much, if any, coverage uh, of, of mental health. So that that's frustrating. Uh, the mental health seems to just not have the same priority in addressing climate change as does reducing greenhouse gas emissions and um, building infrastructure, which are absolutely crucial. But we, you know, we think that there's a, a place for mental health policies and programs as well. So that's that's a challenge for us. Um, and there's in other contexts, there's a bit of a stigma about talking about mental health. That may be one aspect of this. Um, I think that uh, younger people who seem to be more aware about climate change and about its uh, uh, mental health effects uh, will be uh, great allies with us in uh, in in making the case to policymakers, and uh, we're going to be trying to involve more young people um, in in our advocacy. Uh, but um, it's we don't have much time, you know. The, the climate is changing rapidly, and I think all of the all of the changes, physical social, psychological that need to be made, need to be made fairly quickly. So uh, it's it's a big challenge. 100%, thank you so much, Ivika and Dr. Kurtzman. Um, and I really like the common thread I heard throughout both of your responses that youth play a huge part in terms of speaking up, sharing their concerns and voicing what they want to see happen. So. Really great answers there. Um, at this time, um, we are going to enter the audience question session. So if any of you have questions that you'd like to ask our panelists, um, feel free to drop them in the Zoom chat right now. Uh, and you can direct them at a specific person if you'd like, or you can ask more general ones for all three of our amazing panelists. So I'll just give you guys a couple of seconds um, to type out all of your amazing questions in the chat. And also, um, we know that so far has been a lot of our panelists, but we'd also love to have all of your amazing faces um, on your our screens with us. So if you'd be able to turn on your camera, we'd really appreciate it, um, just so we can have that face-to-face -face type interaction. And you can also raise your hand to ask questions. So I have a question uh, that I would like to ask the, pan the panel. As a mom of a 10-year-old son, how do I start composing at home? Like what uh, equipment would I need to start? So my son do eat a lot of fruits. We do eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. And we do have waste that we throw in the trash. And from moving forward, I would like to start composing at home and maybe do a little garden in the back using that to grow our fruits and vegetables that we do eat. How do, where do I start? So there's many different ways to deal with food waste at home. Um, I know that there's some kitchen composters that you can just purchase and it's very simple, but those can be costly. So my neighbor and I have a shared composting system. All we do is we have a simple bin in the backyard um, and then we put our food waste in there and we turn it every few weeks so that it can get the aeration. And we also put some worms in there. Um, but I can Get, I can send some links in the chat because it's hard to explain verbally. Um, but also, I know Angelina is only a, mo is a moderator, but she also has the expertise on this topic. So if you want to add, feel free. Yeah, um, we also do backyard composting with my family. So the only addition I have is that a lot of counties will offer um, supplies for backyard composting for free and you can pick them up. So if you want to do that, then that's how my family got started. And I know it's 
a much more affordable way to start it. So definitely encourage checking that out. Thank you very much for the answer. Thank you for and, the question. Uh, we um, do we have... Go on. Oh, no, feel free to ask a question. Well, we do have another question for the panel. Um, being that we chatted a little bit about children's health, um, what other population have seemed to be impacted by the climate change and how so? So we we talked briefly about children and, and their vulnerabilities um, and also women who are pregnant and the fetus being particularly vulnerable. But there are also people um, the elderly are also at great risk. Um, many of the medications that the elderly take change when, uh, in how they work when the weather changes, when there's extreme heat. Um, and as we get older, we're less able to moderate that heat internally. Uh, and so that becomes a huge issue as well. Um, obviously, um, the elderly also, as you get older, you're more likely to have heart or cardiovascular issues. And so um, also people um, who are immunocompromised, people that might be taking medications for arthritis, for example, um, their systems are less, are more vulnerable and less um, robust when they're having to deal with these extreme changes in weather. Um, other groups of people are, are folks that I had mentioned in one of my slides, people who live in di climate disaster areas. So we know way back from when Katrina hit um, that there were people that wanted to get out of town but couldn't. The public transportation couldn't handle everybody. Um, and so people literally died standing on their roofs trying to get rescued. Um, and you know, living close to coastal areas. And Maryland is a perfect example with the sea level rise. So populations that live in those zones where there are there's constant flooding. I saw somebody from Ellicott City, which has flooded a couple times, you know, 100 year floods in just a matter of a few years. Um, so we're all at risk for various reasons. And climate change is, regionally different, right? So if we're living in the mid-Atlantic states, we're gonna see different changes than if we're living in the Southwest, right? So the Southwest begs for water, begs for precipitation, whereas in the Northeast and the mid-Atlantic states, we're getting a lot of precipitation and flooding as are the South Southeastern states. And so children are incredibly vulnerable but think about uh, when we're thinking about health issues, but folks that already have chronic disease or um, may have um, health issues before climate changes um, are oftentimes more at risk. Um, and I'll, I'll end with one story. I lived in, I, I was raised, born and raised in Chicago. And many years ago, there was a heat wave that occurred and um, hundreds of, of elderly people died. And why did they die? They died because they were living in places that didn't have air conditioning. They turned their fans on, they closed their windows for safety, and they literally cooked themselves to death. Um, so we, we often think about sort of the straight line like, well, you know, people with heart disease are, are going to be more likely to have a heart attack. Yes, that's true. But there are, as, as Dr. Kurtzman said, these social factors that make people more vulnerable and more likely to become sick um, as a result of climate changes, just by virtue of they can't get to a cooling center, they don't have air conditioning. We often, those of us that are privileged, get out of our air conditioned car to go to the air conditioned store to go to our air conditioned home. There are many, many people that aren't able to do that. And we are no longer seeing cooling at nighttime. That concrete retains the heat. So it doesn't, we can't cool off at night. And so, and this is all due to climate change. So we need to think more 
um, comprehensively and holistically about what people, what puts people at risk. And it's not just pre-existing health conditions, it's other social ills that we really need to address. Thank you very much for that response. I'll turn this over to Angelina for audience questions. Great. Uh, so we have one question from, I believe, Aklesia. And the question is, in the discussion, they have learned that eating less meat will help as a reducing method, uh, presumably against climate change. Um, but they want to understand how exactly eating less meat is related. Um, so to, I believe the effects on climate change are reducing it, its impact, so. Okay, so I, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear enough. So there was a slide with a, a lovely face of a cattle. Um, what happens is methane is one of the three primary greenhouse gases and it's very potent. When we eat meat and we have more cattle that is producing methane, the greenhouse gases go up. So number one, if we eat less meat, there's less cattle producing methane. The second piece of that is in order to supply our demand for meat and it continues to go up, we're cutting down the rainforest, we're cutting down the green space that so that the cattle can be produced. And when we cut trees down, we're cutting down those things that take in carbon dioxide. So when we cut the trees down, there's more carbon dioxide in the air because there's less trees to take it in and there's less oxygen in the air because the trees produce oxygen. I hope I answered that okay. I think that was a great explanation. Um, I'm also learning about this in my environmental science class and that helped me understand it more. So great for sharing that. <laughs> Um, Angelina, can I add a little to, to, the, to that explanation by Dr. Andeko? I want to add something very little to what she just said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. All right. All right, thanks so much for that explanation. Then uh, research shows that um, cows are able to emit as much as 15% of methane. You know, when cows bobs or they fat, there's a lot of methane that is released. Yeah, so cow bob and fatting also produces greenhouse gases. That's exactly That's right. Like, yeah, yes. so that's that mm -hmm. slide was uh, mm -hmm. was talking about the digestion and the methane that's produced when they burp, and as the the um, the the uh, stool as it decomposes, oh. right? So all of that creates this methane gas. Yeah. Yes. So it's mm -hmm. when they're uh, when they're burping and go into the bathroom, basically. They create all this methane. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you so much for that addition. Um, the next question here from David is, Edvika and Angelina, great work. How do you convince your fellow teens to take the time to reduce and manage their food waste? So I don't know, Edvika, you wanna go first. Sure. Um, so I think I mentioned this briefly in the presentation, but to expand on it, um, having people, giving people an action, so like a concrete way to make a change has been really impactful. So when teens have a way to, you know, not just get, get the service learning hours or the, you know, the reward and the publicity, but then after that, moving a step beyond and seeing that what they did um, was either teaching a student who now shows the same passion as us and them, or whether it's concretely reducing that food waste and taking it out of the trash and putting it into the compost bin. There's something about that for, you know, the experience working with the environment. So that hands-on aspect has been pretty convincing and then it spread like a ripple. So we share all of the things we're doing on social media and through these presentations and people get really excited to see that the numbers are just increasing and increasing in terms of how much waste we're saving and how many schools are reaching. And there is that inclination to get involved with a movement that is growing bigger and bigger. Yeah, um, and just a really quick addition on to Vika, because I just think it's important. I know a lot of times um, 
adults especially um, have a tendency to undermine how much students care about the schools and the way it's governed. Um, but we have a lot of student elections in our student government associations, et cetera. And I would say that students bring up genuine concerns regarding equity and redistricting and historic impacts from redlining, et cetera. And so I think this genuine care for an institution that they spend eight hours a day in um, carries over into the ways that we manage food and how you can have so much food being wasted in the same cafeteria where a lot of students face insecurity, food insecurity. And so I would say that getting students to um, care about these issues isn't necessarily the difficult part. It's just finding a way that they can make it work in their own lives and busy schedules. But that is the last question we have for the time. I know I saw a lot of other amazing questions in the chat um, and I know our panelists have their contact info on the screen. So I'll pass it back to Melanie to close out and give some final remarks. Um, one second, let me come off camera here. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay, I will stay off camera, but uh, here guys, uh, as highlighted by our speakers, there are so many ways that uh, you can become involved. And here I'm generally highlighting some simple ways and suggestions that you might join the fight to make our world more inhabitable. So this is truly a community issue and there's a place for everyone to make a difference. And as you can see, there's, you know, starting with uh, local organizations you can join. There are nature centers, farmers markets, faith-based groups, student groups, uh, age-specific groups. You can even start your own like Angelina and Advika has done. Um, there are uh, environmental uh, related clothing and uh, clothing swaps and drives and, you know, even starting as simple as reusing, uh, re using reusable utensils and recycling or just reading and learning about environmental issues that are going on and spreading awareness through social media um, is really impactful. And it's important to remind ourselves that, you know, environmental health and climate change are issues that anyone can get involved in, no matter their background or interest. Uh, here is just a short list of suggestions for resources uh, and upcoming events. Um, we'll be listing these uh, additional resources and um, some, some other events coming up in our follow-up email that will be sent to you all after the event in order to keep you all, to help you all to become climate warriors with us. And I encourage you all to sign up for and explore membership with our organization partners. But I want to highlight here that um, the Rolling Terrace Elementary School will be having an event on a cleanup event on Friday, April 19th from 345 to 5 p.m. This is uh, coordinated by a student led green team that leads this initiative um, and their contact is their principal, Isabel Minsa. Um, there's also someone in the chat. Thank you so much for highlighting your event, the Working with Climate Emotions in K through 12 Classrooms this Thursday. In addition, Maryland Public Health Association will be having its own event that morning, uh, tomorrow morning, the intersection of community risk reduction in public health, uh, working with the Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Services and that experience. And if you would like to register for that, that, that will also be included in the follow-up email. We'll also be hosting a service event with the Robinson Nature Center on April 27th. And that will be that information will all be on our website as well. And just if you're interested in getting involved in any more uh, climate events that are upcoming this week or National Public Health Week events, please refer to those websites as well as the National Food Waste Prevention website will be linking that as well, and some additional organizations just to get you started um, in exploring more climate uh, health, climate and public health um, topics. There's the American Public Health Association, CDC, NIH, EPA, NOAA, and you can also uh, reference your local colleges and universities as well. And there's always local, uh, you know, courses, short courses that you can take as well to get more uh, insight as well. So uh, in addition to our partners that were uh, presented in the beginning, there are several people who are instrumental in coordinating the, this event, and I cannot thank you all enough. Uh, highlighted here are Dr. Patricia Kapunin with the Montgomery County Public Schools, Dr. Lynn Harris also with Montgomery County Public Schools, Dr. Mary Shinji, thank you again, who was uh, spotlighted just a moment ago, Dr. Francis Stewart, who's with Maryland uh, Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate and Elders for Climate Health, Elizabeth Beck with the Department of Health and Human Services, 
Kira Abdul, also with the Department of Health and Human Services, Christopher Rogers with the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, President of Maryland Public Health Association, Jonas New, uh, President-elect uh, Hannah Idrius, and of course, uh, the comms teams for all of our partners, uh, partner organizations worked very hard in promoting this event along with our other public health uh, week events as well. And uh, the Maryland Public Health Association has a planning committee for National Public Health Week, and they worked very diligently in helping us to coordinate this event. And last but not least, uh, Rebecca Rare, who's the Director of Climate Policy and Justice with Maryland League of Conservation Voters, and also the co-chair for the Maryland Health Professionals for a Healthy Climate, uh, has been inst very instrumental in helping me behind the scenes to get this all coordinated. And I hope, I also want to especially thank our guest speakers with their wealth of knowledge and uh, their amazing presentations as well. And I hope I didn't miss anyone, but I also want to take a minute here to invite any of our uh, partners and affiliates uh, to come off mute. And if you have a moment to uh, share any comments or closing notes before we close out here, um, please, please do so. Thanks, Melody, uh, so much. Uh, just a, a quick plug for the last few days of legislative session. I think, you know, you heard a lot from Advika about the importance of advocating for a strong environmental and climate policy that's rooted in health and builds health equity, um, and not just passing policy, but then making sure that it's fully implemented um, and enforced. And we're in the last few days of the legislative session. There's ac action alerts that are live and well and need your support. Um, so check out uh, mdlcv.org to find out more information. Um, we're playing some offense, but a lot of defense this session. It's been interesting. Um, so in Maryland, uh, and so there's there's a lot of defense on things we've already passed and are trying to to work hard to implement. So um, just a plug to to stay engaged. Um, and we uh, Maryland LCB also hosted a uh, Senate Senate forum last night uh, where we invited Maryland's candidates for Senate. Um, only two of said yes. Um, both representing the same party, uh, the other person said no. You can you can make your own conclusions about that, um, but check it out on our YouTube channel. So thanks, uh, love this partnership, love this work. Thank you for your time and dedication. Hi, Melanie. Hi, this is Jonas, uh, president of the Maryland Public Health Station. Just wanted to give a big thank you to our panelists and our speakers and to the great work and team uh, that put together this wonderful webinar, especially uh, a planning committee, co-chair, and the wonderful work that Melanie is doing. And for all of you who are not already members, please welcome you to join our association and check out many other events that we have planned for the National Public Health Week. Thank you, uh, Austin, for having you here. Okay. Just want to make sure I'm not missing anyone else. Oh, Dr. Kapunin. I just wanted to highlight how, how amazing our high school student panelists, uh, Dr. Andrika knows that I already think she's amazing. Dr. Kurtzman, nice to meet you. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to underscore um, what they shared about the incredible youth energy, leadership, and expertise um, um, in this area of research and practice and how much we can learn from our youth because they really do invest themselves uh, in climate in a way and environmental health issues in a way that no other generation has. And I think as adults who um, didn't grow up uh, with this level of concern about our world, we have a lot to learn um, for, from them. So thank you for being part of this. It's been just amazing to have youth panelists be part of the expert panel, as well as to bring in panelists who we don't um, typically hear from. So thanks to the, the organizers. I think this was an amazing event, and I look forward to seeing more youth um, be involved in as experts um, teaching other generations. And I will uh, place links in the, in the chat um, about our upcoming Youth Climate Summit on April 13th uh, and the amazing activities uh, of our um, uh, Climate Action Council. Thanks, Dr. Kabunin. Is there anyone else? Right, thanks everyone for finding out time to attend the event. The event was really educative and I got to learn a lot, a lot from the presentations. And this also tells us that we have a passion for the environment and so hopefully in the near future, we'll be hosting such events and um, 
I personally learned a lot, you know, about the things that I can do in my own closet to like reduce uh, climate change uh, impacts on the environment. So I'll be seeing all of you very soon in the next future, in the near future, hopefully. Thanks so much, Dr. Shinji. So with that, I would like to close today's session and encourage you all to be the change you wish to see in the world. Whether you start composting, read more on mental health and climate change, you vote or you know advocate policy, or you choose to explore a career in climate change, there are truly so many ways that you can be a part of this solution. So with that, I urge you all to get out and get involved. And thank you so much for attending our session today. Yep. Thank you. Have a Thank great you. evening, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Bye. everyone. Thank Bye. you very much.